Lack of statistical skills is another common barrier to evidence-based physiotherapy. In this next video about statistical skills, three clinician researchers tackled the barrier of interpreting confidence intervals. A study's best estimate of the effect of the treatment on a comparator is usually the average between group difference and an outcome. However, this study estimate might deviate from the true effect in the population of interest, which we don't know what, what that is. However, there is a measure, the confidence interval, which helps us communicate the uncertainty in the estimate and the range of effects in which the true effect in the population may lie. So the confidence interval is a really useful tool for us to communicate the uncertainty of the benefit and harms of our treatments. Yeah, there are other measures of uncertainty, but um, confidence intervals are, I think, particularly useful. They're certainly encouraged over p-values when reporting physiotherapy research, and they're um, pretty intuitive. Once you get the hang of them, I think um, people uh, find them a, a useful way of, of um, summarizing the uncertainty, whether it's visually or in, in a graph or just in the text. I think most people can get their heads around, uh, around confidence intervals. Though, Mark, it can be challenging as a clinician to really interpret them properly. Um, I find when I'm reading research, the way authors describe and interpret their confidence intervals can vary a bit. Um, and if I actually ask for help, there seems to be a lot of misconceptions about confidence intervals. You know, in fact, one common misconception is that it's actually the best and the worst outcome that patients may have with that intervention. Yeah, some people have that misunderstanding. Other people think it's the best and worst responses that occurred in the trial. Um, other people have other incorrect interpretations. Um, you can't really measure a treatment effect in an individual. You need that control group um, set up in a, in a trial situation in order to make intelligent inferences about what a treatment effect might be. But I think if we think of a confidence interval, uh, um, there's sort of a technical definition and then we can use that technical definition to make a rough and ready useful um, uh, interpretation out of confidence intervals. So the technical definition is, I guess, hypothetically, if we were to run a clinical trial the same way a hundred times, but each time sampling a new group of patients from the same disease population, then 90, and we calculated a confidence interval for each of those trials, then 95% of those trials would have a confidence interval that contains the true value that we're trying to estimate and five out of a hundred wouldn't. And that's not, when you describe it like that, it's it's all very hypothetical and not very relatable to clinical practice. But what, because of that, roughly speaking, we could say that each time we see a confidence interval throughout our career as a clinician or a researcher or an editor, what we can um, interpret is that this probably contains the true value because 95% of confidence intervals do contain the true value. And if we just assume that it does, then we'll be right most of the time. And that I think is a, um, a practical, pragmatic, useful way of um, interpreting a confidence interval. I think that's a, a really good point. And, you know, when I'm looking at a confidence interval and trying to work out what that means clinically for an intervention, you know, I look at a couple of things. The first thing I look at is the width of the confidence interval, which I guess in my mind tells me a little bit about the range or the certainty um, in what where the true effect lies. Um, and then I kind of can think, think of the confidence interval as a whole unit um, and think, well, if the true effect lies somewhere in there, you know, is it clinically worthwhile? Um, and there's kind of, is it clinically worthwhile because it's a little bit better or is it actually, um, you know, does that 95% confidence interval lie um, over the side of what we consider to be a clinically worthwhile effect? Um, so I kind of think of it as a whole bar and think about where that sits um, relative to having any effect and ideally to having a clinically worthwhile effect. I think that's a really 
intuitive and helpful way to consider um, confidence intervals, considering them as a whole package, not just the effect estimate, but the range of plausible values in that confidence interval and where that unit sits in relation to what's deemed as a clinically meaningful effect by the patient in front of you or by the research community or um, scientific community that you're involved in, as well as where they, that combination of confidence in the lies related to the null effect or no effect of a treatment. Yeah, I think that's a really um, useful system for interpreting confidence intervals when there's a good estimate of the smallest worthwhile effect or the minimum clinically meaningful effect available. That isn't always available and it, it can be harder to generate in some clinical scenarios than in others. But I think um, researchers uh, and clinicians both need to think what to do in that situation. And I think clinicians, perhaps the job is a little bit easier because you can just talk to the patient in front of you and say, this is the sort of treatment benefit we anticipate if we were to do this treatment with you, this is what the treatment involves. Your, the improvement is probably somewhere within this range or the average improvement for people with your condition. Therefore, we don't know the future, but we'd anticipate you'd get something similar does that seem like it would be worthwhile for you? And then they can say yes or no, and that's that sort of solves the problem. You don't have to pin down exactly where their smallest worthwhile effect threshold is. You just need to know that the anticipated benefit seems to be above it or seems to be below it because they say, yes, I like that idea. Let's go ahead with treatment or no, that doesn't sound worth it to me. And then you can choose not to use it. Researchers, when they don't have a well-established smallest worthwhile effect estimate. Life is harder, but I think we should still be prepared to put our grown up pants on and say, right, I think, uh, have a stab at it in the discussion section and say, in our clinical experience, we think that this would, would or wouldn't be worthwhile or it spans, you know, the top of the confidence interval, we would say is worthwhile and the bottom isn't. So there's still uncertainty about whether it's um, a worthwhile effect or not. And so I think we need to try and wade in, into that issue. Readers of your paper can always disagree with you and that's fine, that's up to them. They can say, oh, well, these, these authors were very hairy chested about it and decided that they've got a worthwhile effect, but when I look at it, I don't think it is, and that's fine. Um, maybe that's to do with differences in your patient groups or your healthcare systems or what, I don't know, but um, I think it is, it is worth having a try. It really sounds like as a researcher, you need to communicate not just the, the effect, but the, the confidence symbol, the range of effects um, within the, the pause within the population. And as a clinician, you need to communicate not just the possible effect that the patient might receive, but the range of plausible effects that they could, the confidence interval. So these are crucial things for, for everyone to report and to include in their decision making. And I think um, the challenge for us as clinicians is, and Mark, you actually did a great example there before, is how we communicate something that's really quite complex to the patient in front of us. Um, and what I tend to do is kind of talk about the confidence I have in an intervention, which is wrong because I'm using research to inform that. Um, but, you know, there may be times, and it happens all the time clinically, where um, a patient will ask you about an intervention they've heard of or that someone else has offered them, and I know that the, it's actually a harmful intervention. And so then you need to be able to quickly summarise to them that the effect of that intervention is a negative one or is harmful. Um, there may be interventions that sit in the middle and we, we're not sure if we offer them what the effect will be. And I think we need to be comfortable in expressing that uncertainty. You know, we could try this, but we're, you know, I'm not sure what the result would be. It could do nothing or it could do this. Um, and then the nice situation is where, where as you talked about um, guys, there, there's a clear clinically worthwhile effect. And then you can say, you know, I'm confident that this is the intervention that would be most likely to produce a result for you. Um, that's a nice situation to have, but doesn't always mm -hmm. happen. Um, and then the other thing which we're often doing clinically is considering multiple interventions at the same time. Um, and the strength 
of the um, evidence for those interventions. Yeah, I think it's, we do need to be prepared to talk about the uncertainty with patients. But, and it's got two possible advantages. If we're, if we're too definite about uncertain evidence, then that can come back in the future to bite us when we get more evidence. And then we have to try and unwind what we said to a patient. Much better if we've been honest about the uncertainty and say, well, my best guess is this treatment probably helps you, but the picture from the research is unclear. It, the true average effect could be quite a bit higher than that or lower than that. So I'm really not sure. We don't have a very clear picture from the evidence yet, but this would be my best guess. And then in the future, if it turns out actually we can generate a lot more evidence and our estimate drops a lot, we can say to the patient, well, we got more evidence about that and that treatment isn't as effective. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we've sold it to somebody as, as being really clear, then that, that can lead us into trouble. I think that was a really mm -hmm. good point. And, you know, in stroke rehab, often the intervention is quite, you know, we have to consider how intensive, time-consuming, yeah hard the intervention is and in stroke rehab often our interventions do require quite a lot of the patient and if we're asking them to do a lot in the intervention for an uncertain outcome I think we have a you know duty to explain that to them um, and give them the choice of whether they want mm -hmm. to actually um, commit to that kind of intervention mm -hmm. with an uncertain outcome. Definitely presenting the confidence intervals away to allow them to have an informed choice. If you just describe the, the effect estimate on its, on its own term, well, then it's going to be really tricky for them to really grapple with the idea that it could be really helpful or possibly harmful. So I think it's a really useful tool to empower um, their decision-making. The other reason that it can be good, I think, to explain, the, or be honest about the uncertainty and the evidence with patients is it might encourage them to volunteer for further trials. If you say to them, we don't have a clear picture from, from the evidence yet and we need some more trials done in this, these areas, probably plants the seed in the patient said, oh, maybe I should volunteer to be a patient in a, a research study one day. So I, I think that's good. Um, in all these discussions we've been having, we've kind of focused on uh, confidence intervals around estimates of the treatment effect, but I think it's important to point out that you can do confidence intervals around all sorts of statistics around a sensitivity estimate or a, a prevalence estimate or a likelihood ratio or um, a, a absolute risk reduction. All of these statistics can have confidence intervals calculated around them, around correlations. And the nice thing about that is that they always mean the same thing. It's always your your estimate or your statistic is a, a single number and this is a range of values around that number where the true value probably lies and so my best estimate is that the sensitivity of this test is um, whatever but um, it could be higher than that or lower than that and so that um, point and also some nice visual explanations of how to interpret confidence intervals on different parts of an outcome measures scale are all shown in the explainer documents that we've linked to this video. So if you take a look at those, that should help to reinforce the um, points that we've been making. <laughs>